This is the official Winning Time podcast from HBO, Hyper Object Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Rodney Barnes. I want to build something special. The Los Angeles Lakers select. The entire league is on the verge of bankruptcy. Irvin. With me, it's going to be exciting. Magic. Our girls, they won't cheer, they'll dance. Johnson. It's showtime. This week on Winning Time, it's all about the magic. Magic Johnson, Lansing, Michigan's biggest star, is about to ship off to Los Angeles to start his pro ball career. But as he's saying goodbye to his hometown, his friends, and his family, he starts to ask himself, who is Magic Johnson? And there's no better person to answer that question than our first guest, the actor who plays Magic, my friend, Quincy Isaiah. Then I'm sitting down with sports writer and best-selling author Jeff Perlman. His book, Showtime, Magic, Kareem, Riley, and the Los Angeles Lakers dynasty of the 1980s is the reason we're sitting here having this show today. But first, let's rewind for a little recap of this week's episode. Dr. Jerry Buss might have bought himself a basketball team, but as the new official owner of the Los Angeles Lakers, he now has to figure out how to build a team that can actually win. He suddenly finds himself out of his league when he goes head-to-head with Red Auerbach, the legendary coach of the Boston Celtics, played by Michael Chiklis, and gets a taste of the competition. I think I can win this. (laughs) Championships on one. They're taken by men like me who cut your heart out and still sleep like a baby for one more banner in the rafters. But Buss has bigger problems coming his way. The Lakers coach, Jerry West, played by Jason Clark, is struggling with his marriage and his career and with his mental health. He ultimately decides to step down from his role, leaving the Lakers brass to start their search for a new head coach. There's uh, just one piece that doesn't fit. Do not say Magic Johnson. No. It's not him. It's not. Fantastic. You hear that? That is progress right there. (laughs) Who, Jerry? It's me. You're going to have to get yourself a new head coach. Meanwhile, Magic is back in Lansing, Michigan. He enjoys having money and isn't exactly modest about it. He didn't get the same contract as Larry Bird, but 500 k ain't nothing to sneeze at. He thinks he's the man, but pretty soon he's about to get humbled by his mama. You know what? You were baptized in a tub just this size. And the water hit, and you didn't cry, you didn't make a sound. And I thought to myself, well, this kid is in lockstep with the Lord. All I got to do is raise him right. And Lord knows I tried. My first guest is Quincy Isaiah, who spent months preparing mentally and physically for his breakout role as Urban Magic Johnson. Quincy Isaiah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Now, one of the things that I know, but the world may not know, is that basketball is not your first game. Right. Football is. Right. So you had to come from being a football player Mm -hmm. to becoming a basketball player. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the process between the two? Football, obviously more physical. You got to have a body for that. Just being bigger and stouter and stronger is naturally better for football. So with basketball, I had to lose weight and uh, move differently, whether I'm dribbling the ball or um, spinning, like whatever it is, it's a different way of being an athlete. How did you feel? Because we had a big break between the pilot Mm -hmm. and then the series shoot. It was like a year and a half because of this whole COVID thing that sort of delayed the entire world, including us. How did you feel going into the pilot? Were you intimidated being on set? Because it was the first time, like, stepping into a starring role that you're carrying a large part of the show. Yeah. How would you feel? It was very much an imposter syndrome on the pilot. And it was like, do I deserve to be here? And then coming back, it was still a little bit of that there. But I think... By, like, episode four or five, I started to be able to really get into a groove and, like, really 
you know, come into my own. Or I like I I like to think that I did. You know? No, I when I knew was you used to be quiet in the hair and makeup trailer. Mm -hmm. Then one day you started singing. <laughs> <laughs> and when I heard the singing, I knew that okay, he's starting to get comfortable. Yeah. Maybe a little bit too comfortable because you're not the best singer in the world. And that's okay. You're a I have man. fun. But that's the problem. I'm the funnest that's singer the, in the world. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's very, very true. And, you know, God bless the hair and makeup ladies who took it every morning because yeah. uh, it bothered me. It wasn't every morning. Some mornings I'll be asleep. That's true. But the mornings <laughs> when I was there, when right. I had to be in there and oh, you yeah. would start to sing, yeah. and it was like you were singing in the shower. Like you were by yourself, even though it was a room full of people. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. That's that's how you get uh, comfortable. That's part of getting comfortable. <laughs> well, you gotta, you gotta. You are incredibly comfortable. Let's say that. Let's say that I point. might break out singing right now. <laughs> okay. In my mind, <laughs> that that's a part of it. But loud, if you can imagine it, loud, and he would be Merry half naked in the trail. I don't even know why, but he would sing <laughs> naked and loud. All of you. <laughs> no, see, no. Oh my God. I hope y'all get it. No, see, <laughs> it's gonna be solid. The night's gonna be solid because I'm gonna die in a minute. Uh, so on the pilot, your mama was there every day, but during the season, you were by yourself every day. She was, she there. was there. I saw. I she mean, every time twice. I looked around, I saw. Okay, all right. All I'm she was saying. There twice. Fine. She was very supportive. Right. So when she was cutting the string mm -hmm. for you to go off and do this thing, because yeah. now you're in love scenes and you're all by yourself in mm -hmm. L.A. and blah, blah, blah. Was there a conversation between the two of you? I think she, again, I think, like you say, I think she just wanted to be supportive and make sure that this thing that I was getting ready to do, this huge thing, like, I had family out here. Because I don't have a lot of, I don't have any family really out here. That's why I adopted you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. I, that was thus. The paperwork ain't gone through yet. And I'm pretty but, sure yeah. she she's a poop, she appreciative of <laughs> yes, that, you yes. know? But yeah, man, it was just about just making sure I was comfortable and just, uh, by the time that we started shooting again, I, I think I had built a, good, a solid community of people around me where I can go to and just feel... Like, I can be myself and just, like, talk and uh, vent and just be whatever, it, do whatever it is I need to do in order to make sure my mental health is right. Talk to me about the grind of being in the position that you're in, mm -hmm. like, near the top of the call sheet, having to train for basketball, mm -hmm. physically train, learn your lines, act, mm -hmm. go through hair and makeup, Right now, you're going through this press process and all of the stuff that we're doing right now. Right. Going from having never done this before to now doing this mm -hmm. in the journey. And I remember some of the days that were harder than others. Yeah. Before you answer, I just wanted to say how proud I am of you and just hanging in there and continuously coming day after day after day and giving your best. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. I want, I want some money, too. I want to borrow I some money from you later because you're going, I, you know. I, I know. I know that billboard was. Billboard on Sunset. You weren't just saying that I just to you. say it. No, I knew that. No. Like, I mean obviously. it, kind of. Yeah. You know, but yeah. I'm just saying, go ahead. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so coming from not doing it before, I was able to not really expect anything and just really try and build good habits. And when it did get tough, it's just talking to the people that's there. You. My fellow actors, Rob, John, Jason, all of them. Because we're going through it at the same time, too. Exactly. You know? So just remembering that I'm not alone in it and trusting the process and learning, man. And you realize that you got to grow. There are going to be growing pains. Just like I remember my knees hurting when I started getting taller. Like, that, that's, it's going to happen. And uh, you just got to trust yourself that you will figure it out along the way. So in the pilot, you're dealing with your father, mm -hmm. Irvin Sr., great Rob Morgan. Yeah. But in this episode, the focus is more on your mother, mm -hmm. Lisa Gay Hamilton. Mm -hmm. What were the differences? Because the tone in the relationship between the two, dad is more of um, supportive in the traditional father way. Right. But with mom, she's more withholding, for lack of a better word. Right. What was the adjustment to changing pace between one to the other? The relationship off camera. 
being able to talk with Rob and do the pilot with Rob, we've been able to keep in touch, you know. That familiarity. Yeah, we, we were familiar with each other. And then Lisa Gay, having her come in, it was, like, I didn't meet her until, I think, the day of that yeah. we shot that. That first scene, the tub scene. Exactly. Yeah. So even that, that's just, that helps, you know, just feel like that distance is there. And then, obviously, she's incredible. So, like, just being able to work off of her, she makes it easy. I want you to stand on your feet. I want you to have something to fall back on and your soul. Because when these fans are going, and believe me, they Ma, they ain't going them. nowhere. Whole city full of love. Why, they ain't enough for you. I was trying to make you happy. I was happy with my old tub. So there's a scene where Cookie has a new boyfriend, and I just wanted to go play a little pickup game with him and talk to him and make sure that, you know, he could, he knew, he understood what Cookie needed from a man. It was actually the complete opposite of that. You oh. went to diminish an innocent guy who did nothing to you. You lost Cookie because of you. What? And the way that you behaved. And you're coming to break this man down, Brian played by Carter Redmond. Okay. And the two of you play basketball, and you know you can play better than him. And you just bum rush the game, you come in, you humiliate the guy, just so you can get Cookie back. Well, that's that's another way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, Cook's my girl, right? Yeah, I ain't see you with us at the movies. Man, you just there because I'm about to jet off to L.A. and she don't want to be alone. I'm just there because you're a dog. Man, the whole town knows it. Man, you run through girls like they're nothing. Because to you, that's what they are. Oh, so you know me. Yeah, she does, too. <laughs> Paul, you know I'm about to fuck you up, right? You ain't going to have a friend of Jesus after this. I was just trying to see if he could, if he was good for Cookie. Because I love Cookie. <laughs> and Cookie, like... I gotta make sure that if she gonna be with somebody, that yeah. they they can be with her. <laughs> At least you know, can play ball. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that's, that's the all. measure of men. It's bigger it's than basketball. Not you can play street ball. It's about it's really how, how you take an ass whooping. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's an excellent point. You know. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you can take an ass whooping, it's like all right, he cool. <laughs> you know what? Cook, you go ahead. Yes, but you instead know? he cried. You know, so, so it's like you maybe know they ain't made for each. Yeah, they're not made for each other. So they. I was helping her out. That's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent point. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Let's say you and Cook get married and all that. You think she gonna look on the life you provide for her and I think on what it could have been with me? Oh! 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 Think about that when you can't pay a bill or get that Christmas <laughs> gift our girl really wants. Cause she will. Oh! Hate to be oh! you, my dude. Oh! Was there a scene in 102 that you really like embraced? Your proudest, your favorite scene from 102. Yeah. The scene with myself and Rob, where I'm washing the car. Yeah. Pop. Yeah. You think I'm a good man? What kind of question is that? Not sure mama do. Your mama is your mama, all right? Still got some point guard in there from her playing days. She likes things how she likes them, likes to run the show, but she loves her child more. Whew. Give me those keys. You gonna let me drive this bad boy while you gone or what? It's all you, Pop. Anytime I get the, get the chance to, like, act with Rob, it's special, man. And just knowing the things that he do, seeing how he do it, and then being able to just, like, go back and forth with him, it's always special, man. I embrace those scenes when I get to act with him, especially because my dad passed away when I was three. So, like, being able to be in a moment where he's playing my dad, making that connection in my head of, like, he's my father right now, is, um, mm, it's everything. It's everything. Rob has a way of making things more comfortable. Just the way that he is. Yeah. It could be the most intense scenes. When we were going through the pilot, when we were dealing with young magic, it's like he just has an energy that comes off that makes everything less tense. Yeah. You know, I love writing for him. 
I love making scenes where, you know, he's sort of guiding the ship. He's just, uh, he's a great actor. Yeah. He's a great actor. And it, it's so much soul in it. It's just. Exactly. Yes. It, 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 yes. And, and it, it brings it out. It feels uh, authentic. Yeah. 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 It yeah. feels really, really authentic. Always. I don't think I've ever heard an inauthentic word come out his no. mouth. No. <laughs> he walks a cat. Hey. Rob Morgan has a pet cat that he puts <laughs> on a leash and walks around. I've never seen a cat, like, walk in a straight line. <laughs> But he does. Uh, and even less, I've never seen a black man with a cat <laughs> that's on a leash that walks around. So uh, God bless Rob Morgan. Seen a, I've seen a black man with a squirrel on a leash. Well, that's, never a cat. That, that's a Michigan. <laughs> that's, that's something in Michigan I can't exactly relate to. Uh, right. In this episode, it felt more like we were getting into the idea of what a real African-American family is. Like when we had the celebration, it's like there's so many different movements from uh, the anticipation of you going to the NBA to mm-hmm. you possibly going home to the issues with your mother, mm-hmm. to your issues with Cookie, to just what hometown cultural life is when you're from a community yeah. that's primarily African-American. What did that mean to you? That's life, man. I'm even thinking about this show and, like, all the premieres and stuff. Like, I want to do something back home because I know that's what it is. It's, it's love. It's somebody, our own made it. And that's huge, man. And to be able to help give that to, like, a community, like, my people, my friends, my family, people I grew up with, went to school with. It's just, it just hits different, man. Because it's not a lot going on in mm-hmm. those communities, man. Yeah. And, and especially nothing Certainly positive. Certainly not with creative things that are dealing with the creative community and all of that. No. It's usually sticks to sports mm-hmm. and music. Right. It's incredible because now I can shine a light on all these other different jobs mm-hmm. that people could do in the industry and show them, like, hey, this isn't the only thing. You can still do all this other stuff if you want to be in this world. So the stereotypical idea of what a black family, uh, basically a basketball player coming from a black family, is typically lower class, Mm -hmm. coming out of the projects, that type of thing. Right. But in this case, Magic's family is doing well. His father has his own garbage company. Mm -hmm. He's working on the Chrysler line. Uh, Everybody is doing relatively well. Yeah. Certainly for the times. Right. Um, From a cultural idea, what did that mean to you in order to sort of insert yourself into that idea versus the other idea? Yeah, uh, that's the world I know, you know? Right. I, I don't, I didn't live in the projects. I knew people that did, mm-hmm. but like me, myself, I, I never wanted really for anything. It was, uh, I had everything I needed. And um, my mom, she just, made it comfortable for me. So, like, seeing, being able to portray that on screen, especially, again, in Michigan, that was huge because that's what I know. That's where I come from. That's my uncle house in Detroit that I was in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, my great uncle's house, you know? And seeing all the people there and just gathering together, like, it is just love and... um, Again, it like it's not struggle. It's not good times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and not to say good times isn't a great show, but like it was somewhere between good times and the Jeffersons. Yeah. So you hadn't moved all the way up, but you weren't all the way down. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. Right. And that's more realistic to mm-hmm. me, you know, and the world that I've grown up in. So basically, your mother spoiled you. And that's what we have to deal with now and why you behave the way that you do. I, I can't stand Maybe if that you're word struggle, spoiled. Because you are. I'm not. Most spoiled people do. So if you're a struggle a little bit more, you'd have been on time today. Okay, anything else, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> you right. You right. I'm going to just put my head down. And... That's, I'm not doing no more podcasts with Rodney Barnes. Why not? Because... You, 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 we like family. <laughs> Didn't you say we was like family? Cause Don't you know how you to talk. Me? Don't and you, you love me? You be me? going at me, man. Well, now I love you, man. You I said know. my shirt looked like a picnic tablecloth. That Remember was that so day? Long ago. Remember that day? See, you, I didn't forget so that day. Vindictive. You thought when you get to this age, you remember things. And I remember that. The things that you've said to me. I ain't seen you I wear mean, that shirt since. Yeah, I, 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 I burned it. I went home. I won't even go to a picnic now. 
I'm ashamed of how you treated me. I'm an elder guy. I want you to talk That was Quincy Isaiah, a man that I love, even though I won't say that publicly, which I think I just already did. And he plays Magic Johnson in Winning Time. My next guest is Jeff Perlman, author of the book Showtime. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, man. So, Jeff, this era of the Lakers, a franchise with a lot of history connected to it, what made you want to focus on this era? So I was a kid back in the 80s. So I'm 49 turning 50, so I'm mm-hmm. of that 80s child. And I grew up in a tiny town called Mayo Pack, New York. Okay. Small, middle of nowhere, very conservative, not much going on, about an hour north of New York City. And I remember being a kid, and uh, this is not an exaggeration. Every now and then they'd have Lakers on, always Lakers, Celtics, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it'd be like, we're live from the Forum in Inglewood. And they would do this shot first from the exterior. And maybe they'd show a little of like Manhattan Beach and you'd see the palm trees and then they'd zoom in. Today, the Boston Celtics visit Magic Johnson and the Los Angeles Lakers. And they'd show the Laker girls. Mm-hmm. They'd show Jack Nicholson with Diane Cannon chatting. And they'd show magic and they'd show bird and magic with the smile. And I was like, just as a kid, I was just like, I, I live in the wrong place. Like I live in the wrong place. I need to get there. I was just blown away by the imagery. And then you're an adult. And my favorite thing as a writer, I don't know if you're the same or not. Like Mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for nostalgia times a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be sentiment. Yeah. Right. It could be. When water is boiling, I think of my grandma Marta's kitchen in Washington Heights. And when I hear adult education by Hall and Oates, Mm -hmm. I think about going into sixth grade. And when I think about the eighties in sports and I see a Magic Johnson jersey, maybe selling in a sporting goods store, I'm back in my den, sitting in front of my TV, holding a basketball, trying to be magic. So the chance to dig into that and to write about that is just awesome for me i get the same thing with writing the show it's the same thing you have to so who were you able to actually interview in person of the showtime lakers like you talk to everybody no magic wouldn't talk and kareem wouldn't talk and riley wouldn't talk wow you would hope as a good reporter you can get unique information from anybody but the reality is magic johnson has done 10 million interviews exactly even yes. kareem who doesn't talk that much has done yes. 10 million. i flew up to uh, or drove up to bridgeport connecticut to talk to wes matthews right? Mm. Back a point guard. Mm-hmm. I remember. Wes is awesome. Give me three hours with Wes Matthews any day of the week. So yeah. give me those interviews. Like they were all there. They were the same guys who were there. Magic was there. Cream was there, but Earl Jones was there too. And Wes Matthews was there too. And all those guys were there, but they haven't been asked the stories a million times. Like, it's not that their stories aren't the, like Kareem is a fascinating story, but I feel like most people know the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar story fairly well. Like, as soon as I learn that Kareem won't talk to me, well, I'm interviewing everyone I can find around him. So you do the satellite thing. We just satellite around the guy. Same with Magic. I'll call a million college teammates. I'll call teammates, ask a million questions. But I just really love the fringe players and hearing their stories. Like, I love that the show focuses a lot on Jack McKinney mm-hmm. because Jack McKinney was a unique bolt of lightning who came along in that whole mm-hmm. experience. Guys like uh, Bob McAdoo coming along, Kurt Rambis coming along, even guys like they they drafted a guy out of the University of District of Columbia named um, Earl Jones coming along. Yeah, I remember Earl Jones. Right. Yeah. Like those guys make it interesting, more so than Magic and Cream, because they yeah. break it up in their new character, just like a show, how you introduce well, new characters. The, what you just said is actually one of the things we always try to avoid writing wise is not to repeat the same thing over and over. And it's funny that you said it because. It's like they played the 76ers, what, like four times in the championship or three or four times, and they won like three or four. So continuously repeating, oh, they won again and again and again, you sort of lose that ability to be unique in your storytelling. Sure. Going through research for Magic's family, was that difficult? Did you talk to any of those folks, Magic's family? I did actually, but I don't remember. It's been a long time. Yeah. I did a lot of East Lansing, Lansing, Michigan State, rural Michigan digging. It was a really interesting time period to write about. And I have to say, it's funny how people have this dividing line between bird and magic. 
mm-hmm. and in many ways their backgrounds are exactly yes. the same. And I think that's why they get along now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their backgrounds are exactly the same. Mm-hmm. They both come from these hardworking, mm-hmm. roll your sleeves up. I think people assumed, again, Magic had the smile, Magic was a black kid, yes. Bird is the white guy from Indiana, but mm-hmm. I found it really rewarding and enriching to learn about this guy who I idolized as a kid and to find, like, again, his dad was a freaking sanitation worker. Mm-hmm. Like, he worked his ass off. Magic worked his ass off. You picture Magic and you picture L.A., but he was out there dribbling a basketball with his fingers going numb, snow circling the court, shooting off of a, a tin backboard, just working at it and working at it and working at it and working at it. And um, I love how you guys capture the hard-nosed, bust-your-ass, don't-quit, ethos of him because far too many people overlook that and just think i mean they do this with black athletes all the time but he's just naturally gifted and i don't think people know how much trauma that bird went through oh yeah as a kid in the midwest i think he captures that thing that's under bird the surliness and the pain but without it being racist that's the thing it's like maybe the whole world looks at these two guys as a black guy against a white guy but i don't think they ever looked at themselves as that and i think for bird Walking that line, I was always empathetic as well because he was seen as the great white hope in a lot of ways. And I don't think he ever wanted the burden of carrying Oh, no. I agree with you. Like, he never wanted to be the great white hope. He was just a basketball player who talked a lot of shit and, like... But he talked shit in a way that I think black athletes respected. When you hear them talk about him with such reverence, and you don't always have that across the board. To me, it's like the difference between Vanilla Ice and Eminem. Oh, it's good. They're both rappers. Yeah. But one gets a certain cred that the other one was seen as being corny. 100%. That bridge between the NC2A championship and winning mm-hmm. and then coming to the NBA, I, what we try to chronicle is the pressure and the tension of becoming a celebrity. Oh, yeah. Going from the Midwest and then coming into this. Um, I've always felt like, um, certainly for the black athlete who isn't, sort of acclimated to the idea of celebrity, how difficult and anxiety raising that must be. But Magic seemed to deal with it differently. He's, his charisma and his showmanship, both on and off the floor, sort of gave him a different air about him where I didn't see the same thing with a lot of guys. That I think a lot of guys have the talent to be in the NBA, but just don't get the showmanship aspect of it. Well, I think one thing that's interesting about Magic back then that you guys do capture very well, even if it's subtle in a way, is, and it's gross in hindsight, but he was acceptable to white people. Yes. You know, he had a great smile. Yeah. And he was charismatic. And you really capture it, I think, very well, the line he walks in the scene when he shows up at the forum. And I I could not have been more thrilled with the sand dab scene because that's straight from my book. And- The whole thing about him ordering, Jack, I didn't know what sand dabs were. And Jack yes. can't cook. I remember when I learned that and I was like, this is the craziest shit ever. Like he's serving this 19 year old kid sand dabs. Mm-hmm. And that whole scene really shows the line he has to walk where he needs to be grateful. And he kind of is grateful. Mm-hmm. I'm here. This is amazing. It's LA. And at the same time, what is this shit I'm eating? And what is this crap you're serving me? And what is this crap you're telling me? I think a lot of people back then, Jack Kent Cook included, just being blunt, saw like young, dumb black kid. Yeah. Young, yeah. dumb black kid. Yeah. And I'll be able to, of course, he's going to take property. Money. The same with the thoroughbred analogy when he call him, you know, a thoroughbred when he walks through the door. I think he sees him as that, like another piece on the chessboard, you know, that I'm going to buy and just kind of stick in. One thing you guys didn't have in it, not that you should have, but I always think of with Jack Kent Cook, he used to have Claire Rothman walk in and he would twirl his finger and he would have her do a twirl to show her outfit for the day. Wow. And that was him. So wow. women, blacks, yeah. basically anyone who worked for him in a way, yeah. he viewed as property. And there's still owners like that today in sports. Oh, I'm sure they are. To me, the moment of Magic Johnson's arrival, for me personally, is Magic Johnson being driven to the forum, I think that first time, to mm-hmm. meet Jack Hancock and having the car stop when he sees an orange tree and getting out and saying, holy cow, you grow oranges, you grow fruit on trees? And he reaches up and he plucks an orange off. I mean. I don't know if it's still in there, but we do have a moment where he's talking to Cookie because we edit so much as we're going down, but he's like, you know, Cook, they got orange trees here. 
that was connected to a much longer piece mm-hmm. about what you're talking about and him being excited about the orange tree that I think was outside of the window of his apartment. Jeff, what do you hope that folks take away from our show? Well, I mean, number one, I hope they have a, a real yearning to buy a book. At, <laughs> Which book? At, <laughs> Which book? <laughs> what do you want them to buy? <laughs> yeah. um, I think more than anything, I hope they see the absolute joy of that era and the sparkle of that era and the shine of that era. Cause we, we've talked about this and we did yeah. talk about this. Like the NBA today is great. I love the NBA today. I really do. But NBA teams today aren't families. Right. The way that Laker team was a family, um, the way they looked out for each other, the way they cared about each other, the way they fought. I mean, you think about LA versus Boston and it was a freaking blood war. Yes. And there's still, I asked Michael Cooper a bunch of years ago. I was like, Kevin McHale, you see Kevin McHale today. Fuck no. You know, like, right. fuck no. Yeah. That's still yeah. there. Yeah. And um, I think the show really evokes a very strong appreciation of that era and how hard they went after it, how hard they defended each other, the loyalty they had for each other, the loyalty that still lasts today. And what I really love, I have to say, Rodney, I see you posting sort of, you take the different cast members yes, out for lunch. I do. And I feel like there's a certain loyalty there that I love. And I, I really mean this, like I see it and I feel like you're, you're really trying to mentor these guys to prepare them what's to come. And it's a very 80s Laker thing to do. And I really love it. I really yeah. admire it. Thank you. The thing was, you know, a lot of these guys had never acted before or hadn't done a lot of stuff. And I wanted them to feel like they were supported. Like you were coming into a thing to where it's not just about coming to work every day. It is really about camaraderie and there's something under this and there's someone here who has your back. And if you have any questions that you don't want to ask on the day, we can talk about it right now. And just getting to know people, I think, fosters uh, a camaraderie that is, um, is really important. Well, Jeff, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing the podcast. I know you're a busy guy, but really appreciate it. Thank you for doing my book so so well and with such honor and integrity. It means so much to me you don't even know. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. We're almost out of time here, but before the game clock hits double zeros, I want to share a buzzer beater moment of the episode. While you may think that everybody in this show is tall, basketball player tall, they're really not. Magic is a legit 6'9". Kareem is 7 foot 2 inches tall. So you had to be tall to land this role. But there aren't many everyday people who are 6'9 or above, let alone young actors. So what we did to create television magic was basically put platform shoes on everybody to help the guy who's a little bit shorter be a little bit taller and create the illusion that a guy that's 6'1", 6'2", is actually 6'8", 6'9", to 7 feet tall. Different actors wore different level platform shoes. Take Delonte D'Souza, who plays Michael Cooper. We had to build a shoe for him that was approximately seven and a half, eight inches tall, so he would be Michael Cooper's height. After a while, everybody got used to walking in these shoes. The funny thing, though, is Quincy actually had to dance in these shoes. And Quincy's not the best dancer in the world. I actually had to teach Quincy how to do the robot. He never got the robot down. It was an insult to any robot that was ever a robot. But to his credit, he did it in platform shoes. Thanks for listening to the official Winning Time podcast. And a special thank you to our guests, Quincy Isaiah and Jeff Perlman. You can watch new episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max Sunday nights. And our next episode comes out on March the 20th. See you then. This is the official Winning Time Companion podcast, and it's a production of HBO, Pineapple Street Studios, and Hyper Object Industries. Our executive producers are Harry Nelson, Claire Slaughter, Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss-Berman. Our lead producer on the show is Jess Hackle. Aaron Kelly is our managing producer. Shaka Mali... Jonathan Shiflett, and Elliot Adler are our producers. Darby Maloney is our editor, and our engineers are Davey Sumner and Jason Richards. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max. Special thanks this episode to Emmanuel Habsis. <laughs>